everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Anabaptist Perspectives. We're here with David Berceau. Thanks again for doing this. I think this is, I don't know, our sixth episode together or something. It's but, always fun. I, oh. I enjoy doing it. <laughs> this is great, though. Like, honestly, like, so we, you are well known for having written a lot of books about early church history, early church fathers, and we've never done episodes on that. So today we want to do, I guess, more of a profile um, of an early church figure, Tertullian. So how do we even know about him? Like, what writings do we have about him? How do we even know he existed? He left a large volume of writings. I mean, it's, well, just, uh, yeah, this is volume three of the Antonicene Fathers. Okay, this is, I mean, small print. Oh, my. Okay. This is all Tertullian. Plus, there's another quarter volume in addition to this one. Okay, so we've got lots of of his writings. So if we knew nothing else, and actually we don't know a whole lot lot else, we've got his writings. They they speak, yeah, for for Mm -hmm. who he is. He's one of those figures we don't have to be guessing about. (laughs) Well, can you give us a bit of an overview of of his life? Like, yeah, just kind of a, a broad stroke picture of his life. Yeah, it, it will be very narrow because, unlike some of the others, we have very little auto, well, either autobiographical or biographical information mm. okay. on him. In his writings, he says things that you know, okay, this guy was not raised a Christian because he talks about in my past, one, you know, this or that. So, you, so we know, okay, he was, you know, a pagan. It's obvious from his writings, he's an educated man. He knows a lot about history. He can talk about laws uh, with knowledge. Uh, he knows a good bit about philosophy. He's not, he's kind of very anti-philosophy, but he knows a lot about it. He knows both Greek and Latin. Uh, he lived in Carthage in North Africa. He was in Rome at times, but most of his writing, most of his life that we know him, he's in Carthage, North Africa. Most of his writings are like 190 to 210. Okay. It's, it's about a 20-year window there, but boy, he, he turned out <laughs> a, a lot during, during that time. So we have a lot of his writings then, but what are some, some um, maybe some common threads you see of certain things he emphasized, as in, quote, what would be a hill he would die on? Die on. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, <laughs> okay, now before I get there, let, let me just give a little bit more, because then that, I think that answer will make more sense. I was going to read a quote. This is from Philip Schaff, the church historian mm-hmm. who uh, has a thick volume on the um, pre-Nicene writers. He says this. It's, it's fairly favorable. I wasn't sure what he would have to say about Tertullian. But he says, Tertullian is the father of Latin theology and Latin church language and one of the greatest men of Christian antiquity. We know little of his life except what is derived from his books and from the brief notice of Jerome in his list of illustrious Christians. But few writers have impressed their individuality so strongly in their books as this African father. In this respect, as well as in others, he resembles St. Paul and Martin Luther. Now, he would have had an issue being grouped with Martin Luther, I am sure, <laughs> but uh, uh, he would not have wanted to have been compared to Paul. But I think what Schaff is meaning, both Paul and Luther had these strong, fiery kind of personalities, and Tertullian is that, that way. His writings, he is not gentle on anything. He's not lackadaisical. If he writes about something, he's, he's full of passion when he writes. We did a book of just his writings years ago. It's called A Glimpse at Early Christian Church Life. It's not in print now because people didn't like it because he grates you. I mean, he's, he, you know, he doesn't say things nicely. I mean, he, he just, he puts them out there. If you're not already convinced, he's going to step on your, on your toes. <laughs> you know, so, so, yeah, that book uh, didn't, didn't prove to be as popular, so we, we finally let, let it go out of print. But, um, yeah, he's important because he's maybe the first or certainly the first prominent Christian to write in Latin. Before him, they wrote in Greek. I mean, like the New Testament. I mean, Paul writes in Greek even when he's writing to the Romans. Tertullian realizes, well, particularly in North Africa, most of them are Latin speakers down there. Mm -hmm. And it's like, okay, Christianity can't be locked in the Greek language, you know. I mean, the Bible had been translated into Latin by, by then, but most writing was still in Greek. So he has to invent a vocabulary. A lot of these words 
they're Greek words. They are words that don't exist outside the New Testament. So how do you come yeah. up? You have to invent a word. English, having been influenced so much by Latin, um, yeah, his words have in, in influenced us. I mean, the classic example would be Trinity. He's the one who coined that, that word. Oh, okay. Uh, I didn't in, know that. Yeah, yeah. T t in Latin, trin t uh, trinitas, you, you know, and that's, yeah. Yeah, that's where we get uh, uh, trinity. And, and it's one of the things that makes his writing a little easier to, to read. I mean, if he wasn't so grating on you. When I had first started reading the early Christian writings, I struggled. I mean, they were, they were for me, you know, very difficult. I'd never read anything like that. And I remember trying Irenaeus, trying different people, and I would go for maybe a week or something. It's like, oh, this is torture, you know. <laughs> I finally pick up Tertullian, and it's like, okay, he's pretty easy to understand, okay. you know, because he, he thinks the way, you know, that we Westerners do, and very logical the way he lays things out. Some books say he was an attorney. There's no evidence of, of that at all, but he would have made a good one. He, he's good at argumentation, very logical when mm -hmm. he lays out his, his um, argument. This guy would have been ready to die on lots of hills. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I think everything was, was uh, for him uh, a do or die uh, kind of thing. It's, it's amazing he did not die as a martyr. I mean, if anybody should have, I mean, just because he's, I mean, he, he doesn't worry about stepping on people's toes. And what I mentioned about being a Latin writer, He's, he's not real speculative. He, he tends to be meat and potatoes kind of writer. The perfect contrast would be between him and Origen. Origen loves to speculate, loves to, what are you, what about this? <laughs> he, he, you know, in, in his uh, theology. Now, he's, they're both equally orthodox. They would teach the same things on the basics. Origen loved to say, okay, here, here is what the church is defined. Now, all this out here that the church hasn't defined, let's talk about that. <laughs> what, the, the what ifs, you know, you don't see much of that in, in uh, Tertullian. Origen also loved to, when reading the Old Testament, see uh, prophetic types. I mean, we all see that. There's a lot of legitimate prophetic types in the Old Testament. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, like Abraham and Isaac, you know, picturing the father and the son, you know, when he was offering him up. Well, origin in every incident. I mean, he sees a prophetic type. He sees a prophetic type here. He, you know, you don't see a lot of that in Tertullian beyond what all of the early Christians would have seen, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and, and uh, talked about. So he, he like I say, he's very practical. His, you know, big one, of course, is his love for Jesus Christ and his desire to represent Christianity to the pagans, particularly the educated mm. pagans. So he wrote... Probably his apology is the most famous. He explained what Christians believed, what the pagans were saying about them, all the false rumors, mm. and what was true, what wasn't, uh, why Christianity makes the most sense beyond uh, everything. Mm -hmm. He coined the, the phrase, well, it's often quoted differently than the way he put it. Uh, he said, the blood of the martyrs is seed. You know, it's often quoted as the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church, you mm -hmm. know, but uh, he said the more you mow us down, the more we grow. The blood of martyrs is seed. So, but his apology, now it's not brash. I, I would say it, it is not designed to irritate, uh, but he, he, uh, uh, he, he does an excellent job. And when I read that, I, boy, it just was such a glimpse into life back there in the second century, you know, the year 190, yeah. 95 what the pagans are believing, what they're doing, and how they're looking at Christians, and then what the Christians are actually doing. It, that, that was, to me, just a, a, a really classic work. So he was ready to die in that hill, but he, he, he never did, okay? <laughs> Another f uh, favorite theme of his, it's not that he believed any different. Uh, some of the writers, like Schaff, he says, well, he was kind of as uh, inclined as an ascetic. Well, I would say no more than Origen or any of the others. It's just that he's he hammers it on it maybe a little bit bit more. But things like uh, staying separate from the world. I, I mean, everything dealing with luxury, with uh, that they would have all taught. The whole church would have would have taught this. But but he he definitely goes after some of these issues where Christians are beginning to compromise. He would have made a good Anabaptist. Okay, you, you, you do not compromise. Hmm. Boy, here's the line. And, for example, all the, he, he makes a list of all the different professions that he's not making a standard like you cannot be this. He's just saying, how are you going to be a Christian and be this? Like a school teacher. Uh, yeah. In a public school. 
Okay, so they bring in the pagan gods. What are you going to do? Okay, they have this day when you, they're supposed to talk about this god. What are you going to do as a Christian? What about when they're all wearing, you know, this certain, you know, flower or something because it's such and such a, a day? What are you going to hmm. do? And, and he points out a lot of things like that where maybe, you know, some Christians were saying, well, okay, you know, I'll kind of just go along, stay in the background, you know, you know whatever. So he was, he's a very much no compromise. And like I say, as Anabaptists, yeah, we would fit in pretty good with his, his, <laughs> uh, his line of thinking. He's equally strong against heretics. Marcion, he wrote five books. Now, a book would have been the length of a scroll. When they say a book, that's what they're usually mm -hmm. talking about. Marcion... Sometimes he's grouped with the Gnostics, uh, sometimes he's, he's not. The Gnostics would have believed they had all of this special knowledge and, and stuff that isn't in the Bible and all that. Okay, Marcion didn't claim that, but one of the aspects of Gnosticism was they said the God of the Old Testament is not the God of the New Testament. Oh. Yeah, this age-long issue of how do you harmonize the Old Testament and, and the New. I mean, the Old, your war and, you know, people are swearing oaths and all that, and you get to the New Testament and, and war is forbidden. You, you, you don't mm -hmm. swear oaths. There's no divorce and, and all that. You know, people like Calvin said, well, there isn't any difference. You know, the Old Testament morality is still our, our morality. And if you think that the, the uh, Sermon on the Mount says something different than what Moses said, you're misreading the Sermon on the Mount. Well, mm -hmm. that, that's, <laughs> that's not correct. There is that clear difference which the Gnostics saw, but their solution was, okay, that must have been a different God then. You know, it, it just, wow. <laughs> it's just too different. Yeah. Well, boy, that creates all kinds of problems. Well, yeah, so now you've got two gods. Now, mm -hmm. they, they viewed him as some kind of lesser being, not anything at the same level as the true God. But then all these prophecies that are in the Old Testament. So are you saying these are from a different God, but they're prophesying about Christ, you know? So... Tertullian mm -hmm. takes that, and he really hammers Marcion. We, uh, so what do you do with this? And Marcion is having to explain, well, no, Isaiah's not really talking about Jesus and, and all of this, you know, and you're having to throw all of this stuff out. But wait a minute, Paul then quotes Isaiah, and, you know, so now what do you do? And Jesus quotes him. Uh, well, then Marcion had to uh, play with the New Testament and take out these quotes <laughs> from the old and uh, oh. just all kinds of stuff. So Tertullian had no patience with that. He now, Mar Marcion was put out of the church. I mean, he's not somebody in the church. He's a, you know, a heretic. But Tertullian, he, he gathered a lot of followers. So Tertullian goes after him. I mentioned he coined the word Trinity, okay? The work in which he coined it was a work against um, what's in theology known as modalism. We know it today usually as oneness. The, the people who, who believe that Jesus and the Father are the same, one and the same, you know, it's Jesus is God, the Father is God. Yeah, there's just one God. Sometimes he calls himself Jesus. Sometimes he calls himself the Father. It's, you know, well, that, that's heresy. And, and Tertullian, yeah, so he wrote a whole tract on that, which is extremely valuable because in the process of pointing out their errors, he's explaining what the church believes. And so ah, it's one yeah. of our clearest, earliest explanations of the Trinity. In fact, I read that. You know, my background is Jehovah's Witness. And, and so the Trinity was always something like, Man, when I left the witnesses, okay, I'll accept this, but it makes no sense. Well, when I read Tertullian, yeah. it's like, oh, now I get it. Man, this makes sense, you, you know? And, oh, and so it, it's, okay. it's a really, uh, to, to me, you know, valuable writing. Now, there was a hill he not literally but spiritually died on, and that was Montanism. Now, that was a movement that started in the late 100s, uh, late second century, it was this man in Phrygia, which would be modern-day Turkey. Uh, his name was Montanus, and he claimed to be a prophet, okay? And he would prophesy, he would go into these ecstatic trances, you know, and, and do these uh, prophecies, which the church didn't disbelieve in prophets, but they were going to mm -hmm. put it to a close test. But now that manner of prophesying was not something Christian prophets ever, ever did. The church didn't just immediately reject him, but they, they sent a, um, a group of uh, leaders there to kind of look at the thing. And there were two prophetesses with him, and apparently they made all kinds of prophecies about the end of the world, and the New Jerusalem was going to come down there in Phrygia and, and all this, and of course okay, nothing ever, ever happened. Well, Tertullian's temperament, you'd think that would be the last kind of group he would be attracted to, but 
For some reason, he, he was really attracted to them. When he first got interested, they were part of the church. You know, these were people within the church. Mm -hmm. Now, eventually, the church rejected the whole thing, and, and I guess they were put out of the church at, at some point. When he got interested, it was more just like a movement within, you know, he still went to the same church as everyone else. It was just mm -hmm. something kind of his personal following. Later in his life, his last three or four writings, he has really gone over whole hog with them, and now he's criticizing the uh, general mass of Christians, or the Orthodox Christians, and uh, he calls them the natural man, you know, what Paul talks about, the, the natural man versus the spiritual man. The Greek there is actually the soulful man or the soulish man. So he calls the church that. He doesn't say they're not Christians. It's just that they're not spiritual. We're the spiritual ones. They were stricter than, as strict as the early church was, the Montanists were even stricter. So that would have appealed to oh. his temperament, that, that aspect of it, you know. Through his writings, we know a lot about them because we see what they were saying, not from their enemies, but from somebody who's writing, mm -hmm. you know, as, as one. As far as we know, he died as a Montanist. I mean, they were orthodox in their theology. It's not like, yeah, he wasn't a Christian yeah. or, or anything. It just, they were one of those movements that had some good aspects to them, and uh, they were off base on, on other things, you, you know. <laughs> and uh, despite that turn, um, at the end of his life, he was very well respected. And like I say, his writings were, were read. Um, he's mentioned by a couple of them, of the later writers. Uh, Eusebius mentions him, Jerome. So we know he, he was respected and, you know, read. He probably, in the Latin-speaking um, uh, Roman world, you know, of the 4th, 5th, and, and going on to the Middle Ages, you know, he would have been one of the most widely read early Christians, you oh, know, wow. because yeah. in the West, hardly anyone would have read Greek after, say, the year 400 or 500, you, you know, so so Latin would have been what they were all reading, and so here you have this, this Latin writer, you know. So I'm very curious then, how did he view the scripture? Like, can you give some examples of how he read the, the Bible and and ways he interpreted it. I, I'm not going to be able to give you an example, but I can tell you, okay, uh -huh, if, if that's sure. good enough. I've told you a little bit about the contrast between him and uh, Origen. So he's, mm -hmm. you know, not inclined to go off on speculative things. Like the rest of the church, he would be so representative of, of all of them. Whatever the Bible teaches, he takes it literally, he takes it seriously, mm -hmm. and we do it. We don't try to argue around it. We don't try to come up, well, well, what about this? Well, what about that? No, Jesus said do it, so you do it in a right way. I mean, he's not off base on that in the least bit, but he would really be a nice representative because of, like I say, being a Latin writer, being a little bit more readable. His writings are a very important witness to the early Latin Bibles, okay? Uh, this would have been before the Latin Vulgate that became the mm -hmm. a dominant Bible during the Middle Ages, uh, and it's valuable for also uh, comparing manuscripts, you, you know, about, say, how did the Bible originally read, because, I, I mean, you know, 95% of everything in every manuscript is the same, you know, it's, mm -hmm. it's, and the differences are usually very minor, but, yeah, sometimes you wonder, how did it read? Well, when you have a very early Latin translation, it gives you a clue, well, whatever they translated from, this is how that read, you know, way back in the year yeah. 190, you know, so his writings give us some important uh, evidence that way. Plus, some of his writings are, are in Greek, so it's nice that he understands both languages hmm. and he uh, can discuss some of the differences and he'll say, now the Greeks say this, but, you know, now we Latin say, you know, well, I'll, I'll give you one, and that's, boy, this is a little deeper, but the Greek word in the, in the Lord's Prayer, we say, give us this day our daily bread. Uh, and the Greek word is epiousian, okay? It doesn't mean daily. It doesn't even remotely mean daily. Ousia means substance or nature. Uh, epi means more than or super. So it's like, give us our supernatural bread. It's a word, there isn't an English equivalent and there wasn't a Latin equivalent. Now he didn't do the Latin Bible. Whoever did it is like, I don't know how to translate this. So they put daily and that's where we get Give us this day our daily bread, but that's not what Jesus said. Now, I'm not ah. advocating, well, let's start changing how we pray the Lord's Prayer. It's hard to change something that's been that ingrained for, you know, um, so long. But now, Jerome, actually, in the Latin Vulgate, I think it's in Luke, he puts daily bread. And then in the other one, he does put 
uh, super substantial, you know, more than <laughs> natural or, or, or whatever. He, he, yeah. he has to create a Latin word, you know, for it. I mean, you could say supernatural, but I don't know if that would be the best, but, but that mm. would be the closest maybe in English without creating a word for it. So uh, that would be an example where it's neat, him knowing both languages and he can talk yeah. about that when he talks about the Lord's Prayer. It would have never crossed my mind until I got yeah. into to, uh, uh, all, all of that. And it's like, wow, this, this, is, this yeah. is neat having early witnesses in both Greek and Latin. So giving us the background and some of the things he taught and the things he you know, analyzed in his writings, in your opinion, how can Tertullian contribute to present day conversations? What does he bring to us today that's a value in our own walks as, as believers? You know, a lot of what I've said would, would uh, bear on that. I, I would say if you were going to take one early Christian writer, you know, a pre-Nicene writer, to get a, a, a window into early Christianity, into the primitive church, probably Tertullian, if you were going to pick any, any single individual, he would probably be, if I had to pick one, it would probably be him. Hmm. Uh, not because he's necessarily my favorite character or that, but he deals with so many practical issues. War, political involvement, the head covering, modest dress, wow. entertainment. I talked about, you know, the, the Lord's Prayer, baptism. Mm -hmm. I mean, all of these practical kinds of things. So when you're reading Tertullian, you're reading a lot about daily life among mm -hmm. Christians during those early centuries. To me, yeah, it's so valuable for the, the church today to have that kind of witness that is, like I say, it's, it's, things are laid out logically. You can read it. I'm not saying it's light reading or, or, or that sort of thing, but it is readable. You know, if you've mm -hmm. got, let's say, a high school reading level or, or beyond. For me, it was a wake-up call, not just him, but all of the early Christians of like, hey, Jesus meant what he said. They would have said, yeah, he did mean everything he said. Well, I mean, everyone would say that today, but I mean, they really meant it. Yeah, Jesus said this, he means it. You know, and Tertullian would be such a, a spokesman for that, that viewpoint. He's our Lord. You know, what he says, this we need to do, and we don't start getting into gray areas. Well, maybe it's okay, I fudge here, you know, and I fudge mm -hmm. here a little bit, you know, and he, he would say, no, we, we don't. And he was absolutely right, because then after Constantine, yeah, then everybody is fudging, and then pretty soon the, the, the whole institutional church just kind of melds into the world, you know. So the commentary that I've just worked on, on Matthew, mm -hmm. um, I quote Tertullian, I quote him most next to Origen, Origen the most, Tertullian the second of, of the uh, pre-Nicene writers. Like I say, he's usually saying something that, okay, this really helps on the subject. You know, some of the other writers, when I read the whole paragraph, I see what they're saying. It maybe helped me as a commentator. Okay, I understand how they're understanding this. Mm -hmm. But to quote this, to include a quote from them that would help my reader, yeah, they're not very quotable that way. Usually Tertullian, yeah, he, yeah. He's, he's very understandable. He, you know, I can pull a quote from him, and the, yeah, I think my reader will be able to, to grasp this. As one of the more famous early Christians, uh, yeah, the church today owes him a lot, and um, yeah, should be a lot more familiar with him. So maybe it's something where we can encourage, hey, if you want to start reading the early Christians, maybe this would be a good place to start. I would say if you're going to start anywhere... Yeah, you, you probably couldn't do much better. His, his apology, you, you know, mm -hmm. it's very readable. It covers a whole lot. You learn about their Christian beliefs, but you learn about the pagan world. You learn about how Christians lived. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a gr great work for that, that uh, uh, type of insight. That's really interesting. I've, personally, I've never read any of his works. So now this is be like, oh, I should probably do that. <laughs> <laughs> Just when you were going to read the Matthew commentary, now instead you're going to go home and read Tertullian. <laughs> okay, actually, I'm pretty sure I'll read your book first. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, wow, thanks so much for sharing, David. Yes. This, this is very enlightening, actually. Yeah. Wow, wonderful. Mm -hmm.